so fall is one of my favorite seasons for the biggest reason is what comes after or late, later on during fall is, is hunting season. That's my favorite. But you ever notice um, fall can be somewhat dangerous as well at times. Anybody ever notice that? Why would it be dangerous? Anybody have any ice. ideas? Uh, there are some ice, yes. That, that, can be, that can be dangerous. But I'm talking about just walking around in the, in the woods or in your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> if you are ever walking underneath a tree, you will notice that there will be squirrels at the top of these trees, especially like oak trees, uh, walnut trees, hickory, hickory trees. Um, you'll see squirrels tossing nuts down to the ground. And this happened earlier this week. Uh, me and my kids were outside and we were kind of I was teaching them a little bit about survival and what to look for and we're underneath the walnut tree and all of a sudden I'm standing about 15 feet away and there was a, a walnut with the big green husk that landed right by, right by Caleb. And he's like, whoa, did you see that? I said, there's a squirrel on the top of the tree throwing these things at you. You better watch out. And as soon as I said that, another one landed right on the other side. And I said, get out of there. <laughs> Of course, my daughter and son took off running. They came back towards me. But um, If you are ever at Wingfoot Lake by the miniature golf course, please be aware that there is a sharpshooter um, in that parking lot that it waits for people to walk by. Uh, Sarah and I, before we had kids, were, were there one time. And see all these acorns on, I mean, thousands of acorns on the ground. And all of a sudden, you know, I said, wouldn't it be funny if an acorn hit one of us on the top of the head and not even two seconds later hit her right on the top of the head? <laughs> the funny, one of the funniest things, after I made sure she was okay. How many, how many, did we have kids the second time it happened? Uh, maybe. I think we, I think we had our kids there. I don't, it, I can't remember, but same spot. Hey, do you remember that time you got hit in the head with an acorn? Not even two seconds later, bam, right on the top of her head again. So there, there is a sharpshooter in that tree, so please be careful. She's back. She's back, so it can be a dangerous time. So watch out if you're at Wingfoot Lake or at my house. <clears throat> so I, I wanted to talk about, um, I want to talk about a video that I saw, and I won't go into detail too much about the video or who, who made it. Um, but it was on social media, it was posted by one of my friends. And the, the gentleman was talking about generational uh, curses. And he was referring to uh, breaking free from generational curses. And so I want to ask, are, is there such a thing as generational curses? Yes. Yes, there is. It says so in our Bible, doesn't it? So that's where he got his reference to generate, being a generational curses. As it, from a father, it happens to a father, he gets cursed, and it goes down to like the third and fourth generation. You know, we complain about having a bad day, a bad month, a bad year. How about 60 to 80 years of being cursed? I mean, you want to talk about, yes, I've been having some bad luck. Wow, this, is, this is something serious, right? So he got his reference from the Bible. And we can find that. Let's, you're going to have a little bit of, of flipping back and forth. Let's go to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 5. We can see why he would be talking about breaking free from generational curses. We can start in verse 1, Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down themselves thyself to them, nor serve them. 
For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Verse 6, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So let's just keep that in the back of your mind. We can also see it in uh, chapter 34, verse 7. Exodus 34, 7. I'm just going to kind of read through them. Okay, we'll go back to 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord thy Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting in the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children and unto the third and fourth generation. There's also Numbers 18. Number, or sorry, Numbers 14. Chapter 14, verse 18. And we're just giving, getting some reference here, trying to get an idea of why he would, he would say something about generational curses. Well, let's go back and figure out why he would. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers. Let me turn that page. Unto the children, uh, let's see, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. And again in Deuteronomy 5, 9, goes, basically goes to the same thing. So, when he's talking about a generational curse, it always either he talks about his mercies uh, and long suffering, but it also talks about handing down judgment. And that typically, from what we've seen, follows idolatry. So that is the main component before a generational curse is idolatry. And he also talks about those that hate him. One of the things that this uh, pastor was trying to do was get his uh, audience, you know, amped up, you know, wound, not, I don't want to say wound up, but encouraged. And I, I give him much respect for that because it seemed like he was because there are a lot of hoops and hollers and amens. And one of the one of the things that he said was, you know, he's breaking, breaking free from being under, under sin or under the devil and he, you know, breaking free from general curses or generational curses. Um, he was talking about getting on fire for the Lord, having a passion to be in God's Word and to be living Christ-like, and I commend him for that. Um, but I want to I help us understand that we are not under a generational curse. There's no way we can be, even though we see that it has happened in the Bible. And the reason I say that is because I can read, read my Bible as well. We can understand that a little bit in a little bit. And I'll give you a reference for that uh, shortly. But then how do you, how did people break free from generational curses? How did they cut short maybe that 60 to 80 years of curses? And let me tell you, it wasn't just, you know, a curse, being cursed in, in the Old Testament was a terrible thing. I mean, it was, everything in your life was miserable. I mean, miserable. So how did people break free from that? Let's go to Judges 3. Judges 3, verse 9. What was their requirement to break free from a generational curse? How could they cut that time short? Judges 3, verse 9. Let's go to 8 real quick just to get some... Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the land of Cushan Rithiam, Rishath, Rishathiam, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served that guy eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them out, even Othaniel, the son of Kenez, Caleb's younger brother. So he... They cried unto the Lord, and he said, okay, I'll help you out. 
1 Samuel 12, verse 10 through 11. We can also get some references to how they broke that generational curse. 1 Samuel 12, verse 10. We'll back up one. Verse 9, And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Caesarea, captain of the host of Hazar, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of king of Moab, and they fought against him. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And again the Lord sent couple guys and delivered them out of the hand of the people that were basically holding on to them. So, so it was when they turned back to the Lord, right? It was they would worship idols. God would curse them. How do they break that generational, cur generational curse? Well, they had to turn back to the Lord and follow Him and, and do all the things that they were supposed to under the law. When people today, myself, everybody else, let me back up. What it, that video that I was watching, it, the way he was presenting it is the, the bad things that were happening to people and the, the things that they were being enslaved in or the, the things that were happening to them, it seemed like he was blaming the fathers. Um, be because he was referencing ge generational curses, he was saying, let's break free from those. So, in essence, you're kind of blaming somebody else for the bad choices you're making today. Uh, that was one of the things that I had ag kind of against that. If, if we're, you're making bad choices, own, own those, okay? Your father didn't make the choice for you to do something that you did yesterday. Generational curses are bad excuses for bad choices, addictions, sin. Let, let's, not, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that because my dad or my dad's dad or whoever else way back then, this is what's happening to me today. That's, that's just a bad excuse. And like I said previously, it can't be a generational curse because we can read our Bibles. Let's, uh, let's turn to Colossians. Colossians 2.4. Colossians 2.14, sorry. There it is. Not too long ago I put tabs on my Bible and it's been fantastic. Colossians 2.14, we can understand why I say we are not and we can't be under a generational curse. In Colossians 2.14 it says, Blotting out the handwritten ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Let's look at Romans 6.14. Romans 6.14. If, it, if it's not clear to you yet, I hope this verse will help clear it up. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. There is no such thing as a generational curse for us today. You are not under the law, but under grace. The law is not in effect. Have you ever seen a redacted paper when you get a government document and they redact it? They take a black Sharpie or something black and they basically delete what was written to where you cannot see it. That's what I, when I look at Colossians 2.14, it says blotting out the handwritten ordinances. That, I see a redaction. 
I see a redacted paper where everything that you were supposed to do or, or see or get the information for, it's no longer there. You can't see it. And then when I look at Romans 6, 14, that question of why, it answers that question. You are not under law, but under grace. That's why the redaction is there. That's why the blotting out is there. So we are not under Israel's law, so there in, no, in no way can we be in, in or under a generational curse. The things that happened to you yesterday or the, things that you're, the bad choices you're making or the mistakes you're making are no one's fault but your own. The bad choices or the mistakes that you make, at least own them. And at least then you can learn from it. In Romans 8.1 which Big Jim talked about last week, which is one of my favorite passages. There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk after, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What was the purpose of the law? To identify sin. Right? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. We already saw that the 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. We already saw that the handwritten ordinance are blotted out because they were nailed to the cross. So what happens when you read and believe and understand 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which ye, have, which ye also have received, or which ye have received, and wherefore in ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Faith in the cross in Col Colossians. Let's go to Colossians real quick. I'm going to camp there for a few minutes. Colossians 1, verse 3. Colossians 1, verse 3 says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. What happens when you hear it, you receive it, you believe it? What happens is a reconciliation. And jump over to verse 21. Who reconciles us? In verse 21 it says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable, reprovable, un unreprovable in his sight. You cannot be cursed because you are unblameable and unreprovable in His sight because you are in Christ. Christ is in you. You are in Christ. When God looks at you after you've received the gospel and you believe it, there is no more condemnation in you because what He sees is Jesus Christ and the blood of the cross in you. God cannot curse Jesus Christ, because He is in you. 
He sees perf perfection. Jump over to verse 27. Let's see how that happens. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You are already perfect in Christ Jesus if you have believed that he died on the cross for you, that he was buried, and that he rose again. What, what does Christ in me mean? We can see what that is in verse 13. Jump back to Colossians 1.13. <clears throat> Let's jump back to verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which has, hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The word that I really like in that is delivered and translated. Who hath delivered us? There is no more condemnation. You can't be cursed generationally. The things I do cannot be transferred to my children or that I did. We have peace in Jesus Christ. We are reconciled in Christ. Justified by faith. Let's look at Romans. Romans 5. We'll close with this. Romans 5, verse 1 through 11. You cannot have a generation of curse because according to Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. And the hope that maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while ye were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Thank, thank God we cannot have a generational curse anymore. And if you look up the curses that could happen to someone, their families, their sons, their sons' sons, third and fourth generation down the line. Like I said, it was miserable. And it wasn't, man, I had a bad day. <laughs> that's, that's not the kind of curse we're talking about. Oh, man, I had a, that was a terrible year. I, I've experienced terrible years. 60 to 80 years 
of being cursed. Cursed in the storehouses, cursed in the field, cursed, cursed, and cursed. Everybody wants to claim Israel's uh, blessings and, and break the generational curse. There's, we're not under a generational curse. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, Christ in us. That's all I have today. I kept it short. I hit the 25-minute mark. Everybody's still awake. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs>